Fortunately for me, when I got into the business, it was right during the recession, you know, of the late 80s, 92, 93, 94. We were coming out of the recession. Right. And I was able to work around, you know, guys that had been in the business and had lost everything. Right. And they had to start, they had to start over. Mm-hmm. And those stories left an indelible mark, you know, on me. I was like, wow. And they always taught me that, look, had they had a chance to do it over, you know, what they would have done was once they saw the signals of a financial crisis coming, you know, they would have, you know, ch- made deep cuts, changes within their organization. But also from that point, they would have restructured their business operations to have the risk side, but also mm-hmm. the services side to balance the business. Yeah. Because in the downtimes, your services size, you can pretty much predict what those inflows are. Okay? It's especially when you have certain businesses that are inter- interdependent of each other yeah. and you have a portfolio here. I'm still, if I'm not building new properties, I will still have 4,000 some odd units under management. Okay? Mm. So my management company may not grow, but it still gets that stream of income, you know, from our properties because we still have to operate them. Yeah. We still, the construction management company may not um, oversee four or five projects a year. But guess what? We still have to do capital repairs Mm -hmm. on those units. Okay, so they can focus on the capital repairs on on our portfolio. They don't have to go out there and seek a lot of outside business because guess what? Other developers have the same issue. They're not, if I'm not developing, other developers are not developing. Sure, for sure. Okay, so um, having a diversified business that was vertically integrated was going to be key to help overcome, you know, some of these uh, financial real estate cycles that, you know, just don't know when they're coming. Gotcha. But in, the other thing is, is was changing our risk profile. With my previous partners, we were too high risk. We we're doing anywhere from affordable housing, you know, student housing developments, luxury apartments to condos on the so beach. So y'all were taking whatever. Yes, we were doing high-end condos on the beach, you know, averaging price for a condo, $700,000, $800,000. Okay, we were in the height of it. And so that is high risk. So I changed our business platform to a low to moderate risk. So we don't do anything. But they didn't like that. But that's what we needed. But when you have other partners, I mean, everybody gets the vote. Yeah, for sure. And they thought that they're probably the horizon on the recession was going to be shorter than what we actually experienced. Attention, coaches. Consultants, course creators, if you get paid based off your knowledge, I'm going to tell you something very, very important, okay? What if I can teach you how to make extra five to six figures every single month using simple Facebook and Instagram ads, all right? Let me tell you about my boy. He got the paid ad playbook. Listen, this paid ad playbook is going to give it to you for free, first off. Mark Quell Russell, one of the most genuine people I've ever met, he's created over $500 million in client revenue using the paid ad playbook strategy, all right? So listen, go to socialproofgift.com or text PROOF to 904-447-5274. If you want to get 50 to 100 new client leads every day that actually convert, you need to go to socialproofgift.com or text PROOF to 904-447-5274. And he's going to give you a bonus video that helps you with a strategy to customize your particular strategy for your particular business. I Again, socialproofgift.com, text PROOF to 904-447-5274. Let's get into the episode. Welcome to another edition of the Social Proof Podcast. We find dope people that do dope stuff. And golly, today is no different. We have Eddie Benoit Jr. It's, a, right. it's another one of you. It's a C. What's your daddy? Well, it's only me. Well, it's my only dad, you. Yeah, but... my, dad, my dad passed. So oh, your dad only... passed? That's right. Was he in real estate as well? No, he wasn't. Oh, wow. I want to know how you got into that because um, from what I'm told, and maybe your reputation will precede you, you own half of Atlanta. So, no. so Jeezy <laughs> said it in the battle, but you really owe oh, Avalon. So, so real quick, just to just kind of put this out there, how much you're okay? You're a developer, that's right. So, do you only develop the real estate, or do you invest in? Do you like a just a well-rounded real estate? Well, as a developer, it includes the investment process Got too. It. So, whether we're buying the land and we're building it from the ground up, 
or we're buying a building and totally retrofitting it for an adaptive reuse of apartments, office, industrial, you name it. I mean, that's kind of like the rehabilitation process. Mm. That's still part of the investment side of the deal. So we invest into the development itself. So it actually creates value from a cash flow mm. standpoint and also from a residual standpoint if we sell it at some point down the yeah. line. Do you sell real estate often? Not not often. I, we have a uh, business strategy that is more of a longer term hold. Considering mm. them, I feel I'm a little younger, <laughs> even though on paper, <laughs> you know, the numbers are different. Actually, today is my birthday. Oh, happy birthday. That's right. Thank oh, you. Thank birthday. you. It's my birthday. And, um, but we our, our, our goal is to really hold our real estate for anywhere between 10 to 15 years. Mm. Unless we feel as though that we have some presence in the market that is not strong. Gotcha. Okay. We may have one or two properties. We're not looking at future development in that area, in that market. And so it may make sense for us to pull out of the market and sell and look at focusing our dollars and our investments somewhere else where we have a greater presence. Gotcha. What's some stuff in Atlanta that you own that I might know of? Ah, let's see. Well, you're very familiar with Auburn Avenue, right? Yes. Okay, so Auburn Avenue, right next to Ebenezer Baptist Church. Yep. Um, there's a tower there that's called Wheat Street Towers. What tree? Wheat Street Towers. Wheat Street Towers? Yes, um, that's with the Wheat Street Charitable Foundation. Mm. It's literally right next door to it. Um, that's your building? That's our building. It's a 14-story building, 208 units. <laughs> we did a total gut renovation of that tower with um, partial residents in place. We moved 50% out of the building, did one side of the building, and then did the other side a couple of years ago. But I kept the church in the deal as an, as an owner. Mm-hmm. So that way they wouldn't lose any asset ownership. They hold on, have. you hold on. You said you kept the church in the deal. You own Ebenezer? No, no. I own the tower, um, Wheat Street um, Towers. Right. So it's 208 units, um, affordable housing for seniors 62 and older. Mm. So when the church owned it, it, you know, for the past almost 40 plus years, you know, over time, you know, it was nearing physical obsolescence because they really didn't have the money to put into it to do the full renovation. Plus, they're not developers. That's not mm. what they do. Right. They had the uh, foresight early on to build something like that um, back in the 70s. And then so by the time we came on board, we figured a way to buy the building, go through the proper financing keep the property affordable, keep most of those residents that were living there who still wanted to live there, you know, give them an opportunity to move back into the the building Mm. after it was newly renovated, but also created a structure where the church still had ownership in the building ongoing Uh, as opposed to just selling their asset and no longer having any residual cash flow opportunity or even you know, just a piece of the asset itself. Why did you do that? Because of the fact that most, an area like that, as you think in Auburn Avenue, I mean, back in the, you know, the 1920s, 1930s, it was one of the richest one and a half mile stretch of African-American owned businesses. Mm. Were there. And then you have, that's the oh, King was Center. That, the, um, that, that was Black Wall Street as well, right? Yeah, so the, the movie um, um, Black Panther, mm-hmm. do you remember when they shot the, the kids playing basketball? outside Mm -hmm. uh, in the basketball court? Yes. Yes. Well, that was our building. They act like it was somewhere else in Oakland. You remember where they killed the the uncle in the apartment? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was in our building. Oh, that, but that was free renovation. Right, right, so right. it doesn't look like that. It looks a lot better. <laughs> right, I was like, that was the disclaimer. Right? That's right. right this right. is a disclaimer. The building looks totally different. Right. As a matter of fact, there are people, David, that drive by and swear we built a new building because of the condition that it was in, it was so mm. blighted. After a while, you you drive by so many times, you don't even see the blight anymore because it kind of blends with all the other blight. Yeah. So when we... Um, when you say blight, what does that mean? It's just blighted. It's just in bad condition. Okay, gotcha. Real gotcha, gotcha. poor condition. Yeah. I mean, you know, you drive through the hood, you just see blight. Yeah, you don't sure. see one building for another. You're like, It's not like, oh, this building right here is... 90% in bad shape and this one is 85% right, right. in bad right. shape. <laughs> Everything is in bad shape. Yeah, for sure. Okay? Um, they thought we built a new building because we were able to um, change not only the interior core of the building itself with everything brand new short of just the structural side of the building, the bricks and mortar. 
Mm -hmm. But the outside elevation, even though we are in the historic district, because that's where the King Center is, mm -hmm. I think mean, it's literally across the street. Right. The Urban Design Council is very restrictive as to what you can do to buildings, if, even if they're not historic. Gotcha. Okay, gotcha. from an exterior, you know, um, vernacular yeah. standpoint, architectural vernacular. So they worked with us and allowed us to repaint that building. Nice, nice. Which really changed. It was a game changer. Wow. The building looks great. And um, so we're able to, again, repurpose that building yes. as opposed to tearing it down or converting it into condos, which were some of the offers that the church had received, which yeah. means that it had been converted to condos as some of the most unobstructed views of downtown. Mm. Just beautiful. Mm. Beautiful. I mean, you'd love to own a condo there. Yeah. The only thing is you make too much money. So you can't, <laughs> well, you're not old enough. Okay. Well, do you have any other buildings in Atlanta? Yes. Yeah, so there's another one down the street that's called Bethel Towers. Mm -hmm. We did that with another African-American church, two of which are some of the oldest African-American churches in Atlanta. It's called um, Bethel Towers. And it's with the AME Bethel Church. Is your strategy to buy from churches for a particular reason? It's, it hasn't been my strategy, but it seems like it's become my strategy because a lot of them are taken advantage of. And a lot of them are not able to develop the real estate that they own because there's a fear where about half of the church doesn't want to sell because they want to retain value. But then it stifles growth and they start losing you know, their church members over time. Mm -hmm. Then you have another half that's willing to sell, that's more proactive, that understands business, understands risk. So they have to fight with the ones that don't want to sell, but you still have to get a majority vote. Yeah. So with my structure, it allows the church to sell the asset, make some profit, address some of their, you know, pay off some of their debt, create some liquidity, you know, for them, for more programs, but also be a participant in the ownership of the redeveloped project. Gotcha. And it seems like there's a couple strategies in there. One, and based on what you said, you can probably get it at a better number because you're helping the church out. You're not buying it at full retail. Well, it's full transparency. Yeah. So if you ask $10 million for your building, we're like, okay, we can pay you $10 million now and you don't participate in the deal forever. Yeah. Or you may never get $10 million because that number is really infeasible in order to also mm. um, be in alignment with their mission. Right. Because they're mission-based. Part of their mission is to also provide affordable housing or mm. steer their members towards affordable housing if they can. So if both of those um, churches had towers, because the Bethel Towers, that's 180 units. Now, what was going on in these days of them getting the, like, it seems like the church's business model was to get a building. Like the Birch's, that, that was their, their model was, was to that? provide housing because the fact there was lack of housing you know, for African-Americans. What year? Give me a time. So this is, this was built back in the early 1970s, 71, 72. That's when they went on. They were able to um, capitalize on some of the benefits that were out there through HUD. Okay. What were some of those? And as far as financing for affordable housing. So those pastors that were leading those churches at that time were really pioneering because they were very judicious and how to spend the monies that they had to buy land around their churches, but also seek, you know, development of those, of those parcels. First and foremost, you know, the, the housing. Primarily, so, I mean, it wasn't 100% for their members, yeah. but most of their members qualified for it. So if you think about those two buildings literally being half a mile apart from each other, less than half a mile, and you have almost 400 units with two high-rises that are sitting on less than, you know, one and a half acres collectively. Mm, that actually, so these pastors, they were like strategic back. They're like, yo, Very I'm gonna, strategic. I'll get the church, but I'm going to get this building and the members will, will be able to provide affordable housing for our members where we can you know, continue to develop them in different areas. But also into the community that they serve. Yeah. Even if you weren't a, a member of the church, you still lived right there on Auburn Avenue, on Edgewood, you know, of Old Fourth Ward. All that area was all considered, you know, the civil rights district. You know what? It seems like churches used to be more mission-driven back then. Well, there's now mission-driven. Like it's just the fact that a lot of times with the congregation is what really holds them back. You may have a, a pastor, a head pastor that's very 
um, that's more visionary, that's more business minded, and they really want to see the redevelopment of the real estate. Mm. And they want to try to retire a lot of their debt, yeah. get their balance sheets stronger. Then you may have a pastor that's more focused on the mission related to religion. Yeah. And they don't, they can't see the forest for the trees as it relates to opportunities, business opportunities. That's just really not their strong suit. Yeah. So therefore, they focus on programs, which are great. You know, outreaching the community, growing their membership, you know, things of that sort. And just focusing the, on redeploying whatever they raise, you know, from a fundraising standpoint, tithing, things like that, um, corporate sponsorship into their own sanctuary and just, you know, other buildings that they use for after-school programs, Bible studies and things like that. They focus, gotcha. redevelop the money, redeploy the money on their own campus. How much real estate do you own? Well, um, I'm like a lot. Yo, I've heard you. I mean, because obviously Steve told me, and then I was actually talking, which is something else I'm going to ask you. I was talking to uh, my boy Ramon Tooks, and he knows, you know, all real estate in the city. And I said your name. He's like, oh, he a big dog. I'm yeah, like, and, okay. and I look at Ramon as a big dog, so he's looking <laughs> at you. I'm like, yo, this man really owns the city. So how much real estate do you own? We have real estate from Florida, Georgia, North, South Carolina, Alabama, Illinois, and Virginia. Wow. And so most of, all, most of our real estate is multifamily. So larger multifamily developments that focus on either independent senior living, affordable mixed income housing for families, small families, larger families. Some are workforce oriented if they're in transit, or, um, transit oriented uh, locations, whether they're urban or suburban, and some are student oriented too. So that's pretty much kind of like the population that we serve. We, you know, today, um, we're about 12 years old since I broke up with my uh, partners in 2010. Mm. I used to be one of the owners of a company called Ambling Companies. Um, we had, uh, had other partners. And during the recession, we ended up splitting up. That's how TBG, the Benoit Group, was birthed, you know, at that time. Mm. And so even though the recession was pretty brutal, the first three to four years, they're still working through a lot of these uh these, uh, these, these projects that had, had failed. That's yeah. the reality of the business. Um, with that economic recession, we were able to still continue to build and grow and expand our footprint. And so within right? 2008, that, Well, I was still with my partners in 2008. 2010 is when we officially created the Benoit Group. Okay. And then we started creating other companies within our family of companies that gives us more of a vertical integration. Because gotcha. uh, we have a property management company that manages our assets. We have a construction management company that oversees design and construction process. And we have an advisory company that does a lot of development, advisory, and program management services, not only in the U.S., but also overseas. Hey, so all your, like, it's all in-house. It's much. all in-house. It gives us more of a turnkey approach to the projects that we choose to focus on. But from an asset standpoint, we've developed about 20 two to 24 properties over that period of time, which is in excess of about 600 million that we have in assets God. under our management and ownership that we own. And um, all of them have some form of small partnership with an investor or whatnot, but uh, we're typically the general partner. I want to know how to deal. And this, and I I should have called you because I had your number about that. <laughs> so, and I want you to tell me how we should have approached it. So me and Ramon, we were looking at the... Um, uh, South Decat Mall. Okay. You know, that just went up for auction. Yes. And I think I sent it to Ramon. I'm like, yo, can we buy this? He's like, yeah, we can buy it. And he was kind of talking through all the stuff that we that we needed to do. But I think the time was um, taking on how to, you know, how we can acquire it. Do you know what it sold for? You no. Know? No? No. So we're like, yo, I, I think that would be really cool to buy. But I think the auction maybe started like $5 million. They expect to go up to $10 million. How would I structure that deal? How, how could I get... I want to do something big, Eddie. I want to do something really, really big, but I have no idea how to do something of that magnitude. I want to buy a, a, a skyscraper or a tower. What I got to do, man? First thing is you need to find somebody who's experienced at doing it. Yeah, who's I'm, done par it I'm partnering with you, man. That's the first thing. That's the first <laughs> thing. Um, everybody's enamored with big buildings, beautiful developments, luxury... And it's just cool. It's just cool to say that I'm an owner of this. 
but they it's really skip. Yeah, too. of course. You know, it, it, it's the bragging rights. I mean, I drive around with my my daughters, and a lot of times, you know, I'm just kind of focused on where I'm going, and they remind me, Dad, that goes one of our properties. You know, which is it's a great thing. Cool. You know, it's very rewarding. You know, at times, but people don't think about the pitfalls of the business. I mean, it is truly a science as far as real estate development is concerned. It's very complicated. You almost have to know every component of what goes into a development deal. So you really have to be a jack of all trades, but maybe a master of some, because you can't be a master of nothing. <laughs> okay, <laughs> it's a matter of time you're going to lose your shirt. Sure. But, you know, deals like that, you want to make sure that you're not doing one of those first by yourself mm -hmm. or with people who are not experienced, don't have the financial wherewithal, don't have the experience to actually really attract the right capital partners yeah. and lenders. To do a deal like that. Yeah, it's almost kind of like, you know, you do a, a deal like South the Cabin Mall, it's a lot of land. A deal like that, that gets rezoned for greater density. I mean, you could build a mini city on mm -hmm. that land once you tear down all, the, you know, the mall itself and repurpose it. Yeah. But that's easily a seven, eight year project. By the mm -hmm. time you decide to go through the acquisition and you build the last building on that site because it will be over a period of phases. Yeah. So you want to make sure that your partner has done this multiple times. Yeah. And you want to hear about their failures too. Because you haven't done a deal until unless you've had one really fail. Mm, right, right, right. Okay? Because then that gives you the gut check. Yeah. Every time you look at a deal that you fall in love with. For sure. <laughs> okay? For sure. You're like, hmm, do I really want to take this one down yeah. the aisle? Right. <laughs> <laughs> right. Listen, if I was going to teach you how to make a million dollars, would you give me 10000 Like if I had a course teach you how to make a million dollars and you're po positive, you're going to make a million dollars, would you give me 10000 Of course you would. It's no-brainer, right? So in a calendar year, we make seven figures with the podcast. But there's 21 things that I extracted from that that you're going to need to launch a podcast. But I only got time to give you three right now. One is you need a distribution platform. The distribution platform is what you upload your podcast to. That platform sends it to Spotify, Apple, Google Play, so that your supporters can actually listen to your podcast. You're also going to need a microphone. You need a really good microphone so it's crispy audio. And three, you need an income strategy. This is not necessarily a hobby, unless you're going to make it a hobby. But I can teach you how I made the seven figures with these 21 things. Now, the good news is you don't have to give me 10000 my ebook is only 37 bucks. Okay. So listen, go to podcastebook.com and get the 21 things that you need. And I, I can explain it in detail, all the things that you need. Okay. Podcastebook.com. Let's get to the episode. So what, so what, what are some of the components to do? Like if I want to, first of all, do you have any deals that you're working on right now? Yes. We're very in Atlanta. Busy. I mean, in Atlanta. Yes. Um, Share we're in you. Metro Atlanta. So we are, completing a deal right off of a Sylvan Hills historic district, um, right off of Langford Parkway, okay. 166. It's the exit after Lakewood. Mm -hmm. It's going to be a uh, senior development. It'll be completed sometime in July. Give me that some will details. be 180 units, Okay. Um, one and two bedroom units. Mm -hmm. It's mixed income. So you'll have some that are units that are just be market rate with no rent restrictions. and But the lion's share of the units will be rent restricted and also age restricted for 62 and older. So and rent restricted means it has to be to. for people who are are at least at 60% of the area median income in that area. So you can't make more than 60% of Got the it. area median okay. income. Only the market rate units have no income restriction. And are you is that something that the city's mandating or this is a part of No, your this strategy? is a federal. This is a federal mandate. So in order for me to qualify for tax credit investment in the deal so we partnered with PNC Bank. PNC Bank invested in the tax credits, the federal state tax credits, but also did the debt financing because they have two sides of the house. So the, the project itself is close to about $40 million, but we're able to deliver a luxury development for people who are actually only able to pay low rents. How did you get into the deal? I got into the deal by working with a um, non-for-profit called Atlanta Neighborhood Development Partners. They were gifted that property many years ago. Mm. And um, it used to be an apartment development, but it had reached, you know, its, you know, physical use-ness. And um, it was time, you know, to tear it down. It was no longer habitable. 
Okay, so they abated, they moved everybody out. They abated all the, the property and demol- did the demolition. The land sat vacant for near seven to maybe 10 years or so, I would imagine. And they were seeking developers that could come up with a strategy to redevelop the land. The nonprofit and is looking the nonprofit, for The ANDP, Atlanta Neighborhood Development Partner. Got it, okay. And um, so with failed efforts with other developers, they ended up talking to us about the deal and we were able to craft a, a strategy that would really allow the deal to be financially feasible and would attract the right investment from both uh, debt financing and also mm-hmm. equity. And so when we did that, we were able to rezone the property too and get more density. We looked at multiple phases on the site. When you say get more density, what do you mean? More density, we were able to build more units. Gotcha, okay. Okay, than what they had there previously. So the first phase is 180 units, as I mentioned, and the seniors have to be at least 62 and older. Um, and that you could is be as federal- far as head of house, household. Gotcha. So I think my point is, like, say, are they saying, like, you can't go into, you can't build whatever you want. This has to be a senior living. No, I decided that senior living needed to go there. But also the market study showed demand. Okay. Because that's there's an aging population there. It used to be known as an industrial area where there was, um, they used to do, um, you know, a a lot of, um, there's a, a, cookie baking, you know, factory there um, back in the day. I think Nestle um, had a headquarters there. And so all the people who were working there that were young, like us back in the day, you know, they've aged, you know, now because it was back in the 50s. Uh, So it's already, you know, a 60 plus year old neighborhood. So so, So the businesses that you're going into that's a part of your sauce where like, yo, we're, we're just going to build um, kind of like the, the older pop cater to the older population because the economy says that that's what's needed. Well, definitely the market area says it's needed, but just in general, there is a major crisis for seniors as far as housing is concerned. It's a huge demand. It doesn't matter whether you're in Atlanta, whether you're in Chicago, Dade County, Florida, New York city, Seniors, affordable housing for seniors um, has a huge demand. They're very, it's an underserved market. Mm-hmm. You can't build enough affordable housing for seniors. Okay, We're in, whether it's the baby boomers or the next generation afterwards, a lot of these seniors are no longer capable you know, to live by themselves in their homes. And a lot of them have a false notion of the fact that they can take care of themselves or they still have friends. They don't want to leave their neighborhood whereby... When you really survey it, you're like, you only have one friend that lives here and that friend is not healthy and you don't really interact with them much. You know that they're down the street, but most of your friends either have transitioned or moved somewhere or re-nested with their children because they now need some type of assistance. But when you move into one of our developments, even though it's not assisted living, it's independent living, the go-go crowd. You don't have to worry about the irrigation line busting one morning and it's flooding, you know, your backyard and you got to spend money to fix that or your roof, you know, is leaking or a broken window or, you know, your AC is not working. You, all you have to worry about is what's inside your unit. Mm. So whether you have one bedroom or two bedroom based on what you qualify for, then, you know, you, you're able to live in this environment where all of the amenities are really tailored to seniors. So <laughs> you're not going to go into one of our fitness centers and see bench press with 400 pounds. Okay. Right, right, right. Exactly. It's you know, you'll see some, mind. you'll see some recumbent bikes where there are pedals that you use your feet, but then you're going to see some recumbent bikes where the pedals, where they use their arms because they may be handicapped, but they still need exercise. Gotcha. All right. So how do we get into this deal though? Right, how, let me ask you this. How much money do you have to put up of the 40 million? It, it varies. And so on affordable deals, you know, typically we're putting up the same, the first amount of, of dollars on the pre-development process. So it could be about a million and a half that we spend at risk, mm. not knowing whether the deal is going to close or not. And the goal is to close. Yeah. But, you know, you don't close until the wire lands. Up but until you- that point, you have all that money at risk. It could be a million and a half to two million dollars in preparation 
for like on this deal for a PNC to fund. Everything has to be aligned. All so, I's dotted and T's cross. You know what? That was one of the things Ramon was telling me too. He was like, yo, because we could put up $150,000 on plans and figuring out like use and we don't win the bid. Correct. So you, have you been in situations where you oh, yeah, lost? That, in that situation, you're submitted, you're part of a, an, a, an RFP or a competitive process where you have to submit, you know, a plan, you know, for, for the site. Typically, we're not doing that. The only times we do that is when we're in partnership with public housing authorities, mm-hmm. which we've done, we've had these, at least two dozen plus um, partnerships with um, public housing authorities throughout all these states that I just mentioned. Mm-hmm. Uh, then you're looking at a competitive process. And for that, you're spending money. Yeah. Now, we typically won't spend as much as 150000 but you could end up spending about 50, 000, 50% of that mm. um, or a little bit more, depending on how sophisticated that RFP is. Gotcha. Okay, and how large of a deal it is. But there's times you can exceed the 152. Yeah. If it's a major deal like that, like um, South of Cabin Mall, I could see you spending one fifty to two hundred fifty thousand dollars just to uh, to, to and see if you can they, do it. Just you no, know, just to see if they like what you're proposing. Dang. have you lost any situation? Lost yes, money? In- of course. What's the most yeah. you lost? Like in terms of like getting it prepared, you spend all this money, you think it's going to close, and it doesn't. But it's not closed. You think you're going to get selected? Right. Closing is a whole other process. <laughs> That's just to be selected. You can get selected, and the deal never gets done. Because what you were proposing really wasn't financially feasible. Or is during a time where the market wasn't supporting it. Rates are too high. Construction costs are through the roof than what you projected. The numbers are not penciling out. It may work out 10 years later. But in the meantime, you have to decide how long can you hold on to the site. But to answer your question, the most I believe we've ever spent on a deal was about, say, two hundred fifty to three hundred thousand dollars. We were chasing military housing mm. when military housing privatization started back in the late nineteen nineties, um, and um, we went after a one of the military bases out in Hawaii, and um, thought we just just had it, man, and we didn't win, and <laughs> we didn't win. You didn't even get selected. We didn't get selected. No, we came in second place in our business. There's Coming in second place, a third place is just like you just lost. Right. We have no room <laughs> on our mantles for second place trophies, man. You know, it, it, uh, we sure don't. They end up with you a either win or you trophy. get selected or you don't. Yeah. But it was um, that deal in Hawaii. But what we found out later on is that it didn't matter what we had submitted because we had just won a, a major deal in Fort Carson, Colorado. And they're like, look, we have to spread the opportunity. So mm-hmm. even though we submitted, they're like, you're really not going to win this next big deal. Somebody else is going to get it. Wow. And so we're like, but you cannot just sit back yeah. and say, well, I'm not going to submit because you never know. Yeah, for sure. You just never know. Yeah. But your chances on winning are really slim. Mm-hmm. But there's always the opportunity. And plus, you got to stay in the game. Yeah, for sure. Sure. You got to stay in the game. I need to know, before you started doing all this stuff, what were you doing? Were you, like, did you have a job or something? Or <laughs> what did you say? Was that like Tommy? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no. Or like before you got into this, uh, this real estate game, you started, you know, buying up these towers and, you know, real estate all across yeah. the country. That's a great question. I was always in the field. So coming out of University of Florida, I um, was recruited by... Skanska, which is one of the largest construction companies in the world, um, to move to Atlanta. Where'd you graduate in? At University of Florida and School of Building Construction with a minor in finance. So you went to the School of Building and Construction? Correct. And then I had a finance minor. Mm -hmm. So then I moved here. um, So I was working because I always wanted to make sure I knew how to build. Most developers don't know how to build. So you knew you wanted to be a developer? Oh, I always wanted to be a developer. I went to the University of Florida knowing you know, that's what I wanted to do. Back then, they didn't have a real estate finance undergrad and they didn't have a master's program. And they had that program, I would have most likely stayed five years and gotten a dual degree. Mm. Yes, for sure. I got my minor just because that was all that was available to me at that time. But you love this stuff. But, you know, but I knew I wanted to have 
the building skills. Mm. Most developers don't know how to build. They don't know the construction process. Now, they get on the job training over time. You become very familiar with some of the processes, but you're, that doesn't qualify you to be a contractor by trade. So I know how to build. I've built you know, buildings here in Georgia and other states as a, on the construction side. I didn't so, even know there was a degree in... Oh, building construction science is huge. University of Florida has the number one program in the country. Building and construction science. Yeah. So or they can call it, some places call it building science. Some call it construction management program. Some have a dual architectural and construction management program. It depends on what school. Mm. And so when I moved here, I worked for Skanska for about three and a half years. During that period of time, I got my master's in the evening. Mm. I went and got my master's in, in construction what? management. Okay. See, so the, the master's program is called construction management, but also got my master's in real estate finance. Gotcha. And so I was going to school in the evenings, um, you know, it was on a quarter system at that time. It was the old um, uh, Southern Tech. It became uh, Southern yeah, Polytechnique, yeah. which is now part of, you know, merged with Kennesaw. What year was State. this? This was um, 1993, 94, gotcha. okay. 95. Um, so... When Atlanta was a hot spot. You it was, knew. that's right. And we're in the Middle Middle Olympics too. Oh. So all this development was going on. So I finished my, my degree in two years. And as um, soon as I finished my degree, I left that company because I knew now I was ready to go work for a real estate development company. So I went to work for a company here in Atlanta, which is a major mixed-use development company that's called Regent Partners. Mm-hmm. And um, it was baptism by fire, you know, David. But one <laughs> of the things that I was able to bring Unlike many of those that were already in the company as developers that were more experienced and seasoned, with gray hairs, they didn't have the construction experience. Mm-hmm. So I came in with the construction experience. So everybody wanted me working on their deals because I now was able to really give them more depth mm-hmm. as far as the oversight of the whole constru- design, construction, bidding process, and the construction process mm-hmm. itself. And so what I was learning is the real estate finance side, the art of structuring these deals. And so because I had already learned the science in school, but that means nothing. Nobody's going to let you loose, you know, just by learning the science. I mean, you have money at risk. People putting their personal guarantees at risk. You know, you just talked about, you know, $150,000. You do that 10 times, that becomes a big number. (laughs) You know, you screw up. One little screw up can, can cause... You know, a deal that you expended two million dollars to just totally just vanish, evaporate, and, done, can't and move you, forward. And what made you leave the company that you were working for? Well, I worked for them for about eight years, mm. and I was I was blessed, man, because I was exposed to all types of development: multifamily, office development, retail, um, whether it's big box, small box retail, lifestyle retail, industrial. Um, we are uh, medical office, uh, hotel development. Mm. So any given year, my portfolio could have been a combination of every one of those I just mentioned. Right. So I could have four deals that one's a multifamily, one's an office deal, one's a retail deal, one's a hotel deal, and in different states. Mm. You got so some hotels? I'm, yeah. What'd you say? You got some hotels? Uh, today, no, we don't own any hotels mm. today. We're only in multifamily. Gotcha. So for me at that time, you know, I was single, no children. It was just perfect. I was ready to work. I was like a sponge. Mm. And I'm glad that that was my disposition when I got into the business. And I was learning. I was really the guy. Every time somebody said, hey, we want to look at a deal. And the other older guys, you know, they already had kids and whatnot. Mm. They're trying to leave the office by five (laughs) so they can go (laughs) to T-ball practice and pop one to practice. I'm like, I have nothing else to do but to work. You know, I'm thinking about where am I going to hang out after this? Yeah. You know, is, am I going to Dugan's? <laughs> or what club am I going to tonight? You know, I'm, I'm going to just change here it. after work and go hang out, mm-hmm. which really was beneficial for me, um, David. And um, I worked for them for about eight years and then I left. I left um, just on a good note. It was time for me. Mm-hmm. My time came up mm-hmm. and I told them, look, nothing wrong here. Love you guys. Mm-hmm. It's been a great experience. But I'll give you a couple of months to transition because I was involved in so many projects. And I think it took about three months for my transition. And I joined my ex-partners now with Amblin at that time. And that was, um, you know, around the end of 2002, beginning 2003. 
We mm-hmm. took that company, which was a small group of guys out of Aldasta, and they were doing, you know, some student housing development on campus, you know, for universities, but really your tertiary universities, smaller campuses and whatnot. Mm-hmm. And they wanted to really grow and diversify. Mm-hmm. So we opened an Atlanta office mm-hmm. and um, talking about a company that had under 50 employees collectively. We grew it to 1,200 employees through mergers and acquisitions Dang. by the time we split up. Yes. I, you know, I got to ask, man. Why did I split up? What happened? Well, we just had a different philosophy about the business. During the recession, you know, when you grow so quickly and you're so successful, you create you know, this infrastructure also to support your growth. Well, you hit the recession. It's something that they had never seen before. Fortunately for me, when I got into the business, it was right during the recession, you know, of the late 80s, 92, 93, 94. We were coming out of the recession. Right. And I was able to work around, you know, guys that had been in the business and had lost everything. Right. And they had to start, they had to start over. Mm-hmm. And those stories left an indelible mark, you know, on me. I was like, wow. And they always taught me that, look, had they had a chance to do it over, you know, what they would have done was once they saw the signals of a financial crisis coming, you know, they would have, you know, ch- made deep cuts, changes within their organization. But also from that point, they would have restructured their business operations to have the risk side, but also mm-hmm. the services side to balance the business. Yeah, Because in the downtimes, your services side, you can pretty much predict what those inflows are. Okay, it's especially when you have certain businesses that are inter- interdependent of each other mm-hmm. and you have a portfolio here. I'm still, if I'm not building new properties, I will still have 4,000 some odd units under management. Mm. Okay, so my management company may not grow, but it still gets that stream of income, you know, from our properties because we still have to operate them. Yeah. We still, the construction management company may not um, oversee four or five projects a year. But guess what? We still have to do capital repairs Mm -hmm. on those units. Okay, so they can focus on the capital repairs on on our portfolio. They don't have to go out there and seek a lot of outside business because guess what? Other developers have the same issue. They're not, if I'm not developing, other developers are not developing. Sure, for sure. Okay, so um, having a diversified business that was vertically integrated was going to be key to help overcome, you know, some of these uh, financial real estate cycles that, you know, just don't know when they're coming. Gotcha. But in, the other thing is, is was changing our risk profile. With my previous partners, we were too high risk. We we're doing anywhere from affordable housing, you know, student housing developments, luxury apartments to condos on the so beach. So y'all were taking whatever. Yes, we were doing high-end condos on the beach, you know, averaging price for a condo, $700,000, $800,000. Okay, we were in the height of it. And so that is high risk. So I changed our business platform to a low to moderate risk. So we don't do anything like like that. But that's what we needed. But when you have other partners, I mean, everybody gets to vote. Yeah, for sure. And they thought that they're probably the horizon on the recession was going to be shorter than what we actually experienced. So 2007, even though we saw the recession towards the end of 2007, fourth quarter, Countrywise of the world going down and whatnot, they they thought that hey this thing will recover, you know, in the next twelve months. Well, two thousand eight, you realize it doesn't recover. Two thousand nine, you're like it's getting deeper. That's when really everything is being uncovered. The deals that people thought were still going to be successful and whatnot because this recession would go by in twelve to eighteen months, and guess what? We're even deeper into it. You are talented, but the biggest problem you have is you do not have a community. If you take your talents and put it in the right community, it will grow. It's like you have a really special seed. If you put it in the right environment, the right soil, it grows. When it's in the wrong soil, it just doesn't grow. You are a very special seed, but you're just in the wrong soil. You're around the wrong people. Do you know at The Morning Meetup, themorningmeetup.com, there's five to 700 entrepreneurs together every single day. The ground is fertile. I'm teaching entrepreneurship from 
very basic, practical steps on how to grow your business. Inside the morning meetup, we've had multiple people. I've helped dozens of people quit their job, first off. I'm the best coach in the world. So I want you to join the community. Not for me, though. Even though I'm going to give you some really good information, I want you to be around this environment of other people that are winning, okay? So go to themorningmeetup.com and just do the dollar trial. If you like it, you can stay. It's only $79 a month. I just want you to taste test it. But if you don't, if you do taste test it, you're like, I don't like this. I don't like David. I don't like the way he looks. It's too early in the morning. It's actually 8 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. You can just leave. No obligation. It's all good. Nobody's going to chase you down, okay? So go to themorningmeetup.com. This is exactly what you've been looking for. Did you acquire some real estate in that time frame? We acquired real estate as a company during that time frame. Was it like pennies on the dollar? No, we weren't. At that time, we weren't in a position to um, be that type of an, uh, of an investor. We were really acquiring to continue to develop deals. Gotcha. Okay, you you really didn't see the high discount on real estate until you know post twenty ten. Gotcha. Okay, twenty ten to twenty thirteen, that's when most of the deals. At this point, the lenders have given you you know all kinds of forbearances for like six months, extended to twelve months from two thousand eight two thousand nine. Then they're like, this is not working. Now you're looking at foreclosure, or you're looking at a deed in lieu of foreclosure, mm-hmm. and now the asset is under receivership. Then you go through, you know, if they're not, a, if you as a developer, you're not able to find a, you know, a, a suitor yeah. to buy it, to do a deed in lieu of foreclosure, then it's under receivership. You've finally given up the keys and then now they're going to put it out in the market and that's a process. Mm. So 2010, end of 20, 2009, 2010, that's when, you know, the vultures were out there. Mm. You know, the bottom feeders, they're like, look, we can get <laughs> deals. 30 cents on the dollar, 50 cents on the dollar. So from that 2010 to 2013. Are those bottom feeders or oh, yeah. savvy investors? Well, it's both. I mean, you know, some, it depends on who's on the other side. Okay. Right, right. For <laughs> who's, sure. who's the seller? Yeah, <laughs> right, right, as far right. as what, what title you're going to give. Them, yeah. Okay. Right, but right, right. No, I mean, we'll call it, you know, bottom feeders. Some, there are people that they're have taking their, advantage. Yeah, they're always taking people. advantage. Yeah. It's at the end of the day, they take advantage. It doesn't matter whether you're church, whether you're, older gentleman, older lady, and whatever, there's an opportunity and they feel as though that, hey, we can take advantage here. We have leverage. They're going to mm. push the leverage. Right. Okay. Now you have other people who are very conscious, you know, investors, and they're looking at um, getting a good deal, but at the same time, they're not trying to destroy um, the person that's selling, especially Gosh. if they're in a bad way. They're trying to figure out a way they always come in with some form of a win-win. It may not necessarily be what you believe the win yeah. is, but it is an effort to try to get you at par somehow and make sure that you don't hurt too much. Too, so too that's kind of why, why you do the deal with the churches and say, yeah, well, you can retain some equity. So that- Oh, yeah. It's a different structure, a different yeah. formula, because then it satisfies both part of the, sure. parts of the congregation. The, the ones that are saying no because they're, they're just trying to preserve what they have gotcha. and don't know, you don't want to lose it. And they don't understand, you know, what selling means and what would happen with those funds. And then you have those who understand a little bit better and they're more business savvy. And so therefore, we're like, look, you can sell, make some profit, retire some debt, create more liquidity, improve your campuses. Mm -hmm. And then, but also be part of this redevelopment for long term. For sure. Okay, so you still have a piece of this deal. So you are and a part owner of the transaction. You're not the managing partner, yeah. but you are a partner. Yeah. You know, so that works well. The public housing authorities is no different as far as how we partner with them. We, you know, they'll put the land in the deal, you know, most of the time. And they typically have anywhere from a 20, you know, to 50% ownership in the deal as we redevelop it. Mm. So when y'all split, does, is it like I take some of the real estate, you take some of the real estate? Uh, yes, we did. We we had some, for me, I took, I didn't take a lot of operating properties. I took a couple that were under development. And then I took the development rights that we had created okay. for future properties. Hmm. Because I needed some assets in order to have a balance sheet that showed assets as yeah. a new company. Gotcha. Which is one of the mistakes many companies make. You know, they go into business and they think just having capital is enough. Well, most lenders want to see that you have, you know, assets that are truly income producing. Right, right, right. So when you show you have two 
um, multifamily buildings that are three or four or 500 units that are producing, you know, cash flow annually. And those are tangible assets that have value. You know, they have permanent financing on them. They like that kind of collateral yeah. on your balance sheet. But they also like to see liquidity too. Right, I feel but like. But the thing about liquidity, like. it's all about a, a period of time. Yeah. Right now, as we sit, you can sit, you can have $10 million in your bank. And then we leave and go to Vegas and then we blow about five million. <laughs> right, okay, right, you right. come back on Monday, you only have five million of liquidity. Yeah. It's not gonna happen the same way with but your bill. Exactly. Sick. Gotcha, so gotcha. we we did that. I took that route um, because I really didn't want any of the older properties, I didn't want any of the older headaches or whatnot. And it was good. And plus, I presided over the development company anyway. So it was easy for us to make that transact transition because a lot of those relationships on the new development rights on deals, you know, we had created, mm. my team had. So it was an easy, um, you know, line for us to, to, to draw based on the assets that we had that were both already operating and non-operating. Gotcha. Did you did you pick up something big in like the 2010 to 2013 in Atlanta? Did you pick up like any really big deals? You know what? Yes, we did pick up, you know, some great deals. And because we we did those, believe it or not, through RFPs. What's the RFP? The request for, you know, proposals. Yes. Or a request for qualification, okay. RFQ. No different than what South Cab Mall is doing. Right. So we were able to go through some RFPs with these public housing authorities that were looking to, you know, redevelop their property because they had the old, right. you know, public housing duplexes. What'd you, what'd you get? Anything um, I know of? Let me see. Because I really want to start well? riding around Atlanta. But like, oh, so for ah, example, we got story. one in Sandy Springs. Mm -hmm. um, it's a mid-rise, 100 units. Um, we call it uh, Sterling Place. It's for, I don't know how familiar you are with Sandy Springs, but remember but, but, where the old Ruth Chris Steakhouse used to be? Yes. Literally across the street from it. It was an old public housing deal that was done by Fulton County Housing The Ruth Chris right on 285? Right there. It's now an orthopedic center. But right across from it, there was this old mid-rise building and you probably never looked at it because it would look, it was in poor condition. It was built like in 1972 by the um, Housing Authority of Fulton County. Mm. But just think in 72, that part of town was considered no man's land. So that's why they built public wow. housing there. It was for seniors. And so now let's fast forward. What year did you, were you did you move here? I came here 2001. Okay, just think in 2001. Most people didn't, still didn't even know, you know, think about Sandy Springs as far as moving to Sandy Springs, mm -hmm. being what's considered north of Buckhead. Right. All right? So now let's fast forward 2021. What's happening there oh, with Sandy Springs, okay? Lit. Exactly. So that building was there and we we're able to do a, buy it from the housing authority, do a partnership deal, get tax credits and totally redevelop Who's that. Who's your partner with? The Housing Authority of Fulton County. You par so what does that partnership look like? Do they own some of the building? Yeah, so they're part owner. Gotcha. So we're 70% owner, they're 30% owner. Dang! And totally redid the deal. Bu okay. Building and in Sandy Springs, right off 20. I know exactly what you're units. talking about. 100 yeah. units. And you know what's even more interesting? Most of the people that live in there don't pay more than $100 in rent. No way! Because they're getting the full subsidy from the federal government. In Sandy Springs? In Sandy Springs. They all have project-based revenue systems, you know, by the federal government, you know, through the housing authority. So they pay $100. And oh, some pay zero. How much y'all, and some people, and what y'all get? We get the rent that's commensurate with that area. So there's mostly one bedroom. Y'all get more. So there's 98 one-bedrooms here, and I still remember the numbers. And there are two units that are two bedrooms. And those rents are now just went a little bit past a thousand dollars, eleven hundred dollars. But you mm. still have to operate, okay? You still pay their utilities. So that is all full, all inclusive rent. But the seniors that live here, what's more interesting about this property is the fact that when we first took over the development, about 80 percent, 75 to 80 percent of the residents were Russian. Really? Yes. Now it's more like uh, close to 50% Russian. So we had to have Russian speaking um, assistant managers or managers and technicians on site. And our leases were both English and in Russian. And if you come there in the afternoon, 
you see most just nothing but beautiful cars in the parking lot. Mm-hmm. Because all of their kids live either in Buckhead, Sandy Springs, Dunwoody, yeah. Roswell, East Cobb, you know, a Buckhead. For sure. For and sure. so they're able to live pretty close, you know, to their parents and come visit. And we're right, we're in the heart of the Sandy Springs city center now, yeah. which is real estate values have skyrocketed. I mean, right next door to us are apartments that are renting for $2.50 a square foot. Okay. A one bedroom at least. Sixteen to eighteen hundred dollars, and then on the right of us are townhomes starting at seven hundred thousand dollars. God, hey, which makes the your property value insane. Why do you only get eleven hundred if that is the that's not the market? That's not the goal. Well, it's not market. You still have to be sixty percent of the area market. You know, I see. You know, I see. median median income. So that you, you have a fair market rent that's not necessarily going to be always equal to what the market rent is depending on where you are. Like when you're in um, metropolitan areas, Mm -hmm. like Atlanta, you know, some of the uh, the counties within the metropolitan area, yeah, your rents for the affordable deals may be close to what the market rents are. Mm -hmm. But once you start going to suburban areas and rural areas or quasi-rural areas, then you can see a lower rent than what the market rent would be. So that's all based on, you know, the federal regulations. It gives, the federal regulations stipulate what those rent levels are supposed to be for all of these different areas. Gotcha. We're going through a situation right now where, you know, kind of like COVID and, you know, all the stuff that's going on. What do you foresee? What do you think is going to happen after? After COVID? Yeah, after COVID. Well, one of the main things is that you'll have most residents will be happy because they'll be able to use their common areas. Because mm-hmm. those have been shut down since March. Right. Because so whether you have a, you know, club room or you have a theater, you have hair salons and whatnot, barbers, those spaces, we've had to close them. Or you've had uh, computer centers, we've had to cl- close them. Fitness centers, we've had to limit the number of people that can go into a fitness center oh, sure, dude. and whatnot in order to keep, you know, the, uh, uh, you know, people safe. My, my, my question is, what do you think is going to happen in the real estate market in terms of, do you think there'll ever be a... 2010 to 2013 time frame for real oh, estate? I definitely believe it will happen. I mean, we're going through an inflationary period. I mean, with all this, the stimulus money that's come out, um, you know, over the past, you know, 18 months and more to come, uh, you, you have to pay back somehow. Mm-hmm. Rates are at all time low st- still. We'll, we, we definitely will see, you know, a hike in interest rates at some point. Um, not know exactly what it is. If I knew what it was, I wouldn't be in real estate. I'd be selling, you know, those types of predictions. Right, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so um, rates will go up and, you know, at some point. Have you slowed sure. down buying commercial property right now? Do you think right now is a good time to be getting in the game or no? Well, I don't think this is a good time to be getting in the game by yourself. Oh, for sure. I think you should be get, getting in the game with somebody that's already in the game. Yeah. But I think there are opportunities that will definitely be out there. Uh, Pre-COVID, from what our, we believe, we were already in a bubble as it relates to just um, the product type overbuilding, of whether it's office or multifamily. Mm-hmm. I mean, you drive around, you know, Buckhead at night, COVID or not, people still need a place to live. Yeah. The issue is whether or not some of these developments are meeting a price resistance mm-hmm. or they're meeting, you know, the far end of the elasticity of demand. And there's only so many people that can live and pay, live downtown or live midtown or live in Buckhead and pay, you know, $1,800 to $2,000 for a one bedroom. For sure. Yeah, that may be cool. You don't necessarily have to use your car and whatnot. At some point, you're going to say, man, I could move to Sandy Springs or I could move to Shambly mm-hmm. or Brookhaven and get a two-bedroom, you know, for the same price or less than have a roommate or buy, or buy a house yeah. or buy a townhome. And, and so you know, people talk about, you know, just the younger generations and building for them. We never really thought that that was the, the wise business direction. Yeah. Because a lot of the the younger you know generation, they have you know phantom income, and nobody takes into account 
Phantom income. That phantom income, you know, so you'll say, well, this this young lady or this young guy, man, he's actually making about forty five to sixty thousand dollars. So therefore yeah. they can afford to rent that apartment. But guess what? They're only 22, 23 years old. They're fresh mm-hmm. out of college. They don't have a car payment because their parents, who may be us, yeah. you know, gave them a car. Yeah. They have a nice car. You know, it's part of their, you know, gift for mm-hmm. graduation. Mm-hmm. They have a nice car, so they have no car payment. And oh, by the way, they don't pay for their car insurance still because they're still on mom and dad's right. insurance program. Right, right, okay? right. Okay? Right. So you don't have a car payment, you don't have insurance. You don't, you don't pay for insurance. Oh, by the way, your cell phone plan is still, it's on, still your on your parents' cell phone. Right, right, right. Oh, by the way, you still use that Amex card that you were using in college mm-hmm. to put gas in your car, mm-hmm. to drive around. At least it doesn't matter what the gas price is yeah. because you don't pay for that bill. Yeah. You're still on your parents, you know, medical, um, you know, plan because you you haven't aged out. Yeah. Okay. Or you may be on your own through your company, your employee only. So it's really not costing you a lot. Yeah. So you start adding all these dollars together. You, you, you look at the fact that, oh man, that's creating more discretionary income for them. Yeah. So as opposed to a young person coming out of school that doesn't have those opportunities. Yeah. You know, their parents can't really, you know, they, they buy, have to buy their own car. Yeah. You know, we had to buy our first for sure. We had to pay for insurance. We had to do all of that in yeah. our time. Um, most of us didn't have parents that could actually give us, you know, that starter kit. Yeah. All right. And then you have a lot of these kids too, you know, they spend that first six months to a year renesting with their parents. Yeah. You know, with the notion of saving money right. so they can move out on their so own. It's not a true, like you can't really... Phantom income, yeah, right so there. you yeah. can't say that even though they fall into the demographic and they're really part of your target, but their affordability, the moment they lose their job, you know, they can't continue. Yeah. Or they have to get another job paying less and in the moment their parents cut them off yeah. and it's like, okay, all right, this Shell lifestyle shock, is exactly, Goodness it's gracious. a different world, yeah. you know, for them. But you see a lot of vacancies. Mm. In these apartment buildings, in the right now, so, yeah, it is. even before COVID, you would see a lot of dark units. I want to, yeah. First, let me just ask: you, Do you got any buildings you can sell me? I want to. I need a commercial building, like I want to build out like a, a like a talk show set, yeah, like a stage. Like I want to be able to. I want to build like the Arsenio Hall show, or like April, eight, like Oprah, like with the Escalade. That's what I want. You got any buildings that you want? Like nothing oh, like that. No. Yeah. Again, everything is usually apartments, multi family gotcha. apartments. We have a couple of commercial properties. Desk, like, well, you, we see them all the time. We just don't pay attention to them because that's not really within can our you wheelhouse. Have it? Can you I like... will definitely let you know now that I know that you're looking for yeah. that. But you've been to our office, so that's not multifamily. Yeah. That is commercial office, small businesses, and whatnot. The way that one is set up, and we've got another one like that. And so every once in a while, we'll also have some commercial space under our multifamily building. Do you get do you get like really good deals that you just it's just too small of a deal for you to like? Basically? Most of the time, they're too small. A lot but of times, they're, 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 they're good deals. How high are you, man? <laughs> you got me. I know. Not Come on, man. You up now? You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 need, I need some help. Hey, love. hey. Well, yeah, I definitely will. You know, keep you posted. There's a lot of deals out there, mm-hmm. but one of the things that I tell you know you know, people like yourselves. By the time a broker's listing it Mm. and it's just widespread, you're not getting a deal. Mm. Okay? You really want to get the deal before it's listed with a broker. Yeah. I know Joe over here is looking to sell this deal and, you know, he has a business there or, you know, uh, Sue has this property and it's been operating her restaurant there for a while and is looking at retiring and closing the business within about a year or two. That's what and I know you're at. patient. You know, you don't have to have it now. This would be a great retrofit for you or tear down and build. The location is great. It's in the environment that you want to be in mm. and whatnot. And guess what? We can sit down, you know, with either one of them and talk about, you know, a deal because you can provide them flexibility and they can provide you flexibility on the pricing and how you pay. Mm. Sometimes you could even get partial owner financing on some of these deals. Right. I'm in yeah. owner financing right now. Yeah, now, you, I like you're owner structure. financing because the person has it paid off. Yeah. They don't need all the money up front. Mm-hmm. They like getting a good chunk of it on the front end. Mm-hmm. And then the, you know, it's kind of like an annuity. Mm-hmm. If you finance it over five years, or over 10 years. So to them, they're like, I know I got this steady stream coming in. 
hey, Beasley, you might be able to get a restaurant for the low. <laughs> you know what I mean? I'm, I'm over here. He going to look out for us. You know what I mean? Yo, Eddie, man, this, is, this has been a very enlightening conversation. You are the wisest person I've ever heard talk about real estate. It's just like it's, you see like all of the different factors. So you have to. You have to because I say this all the time. You know, there's the science part and then there's the art side. And everybody who's competing out there to do the next apartment deal, a hotel deal, they all understand the science. They know how to go through the process. Mm -hmm. It's a matter of who's more meticulous, you know, than the other. All mm -hmm. right. But the art is where it really comes in. How, what do I see that you can't see? Yeah. And so when you look at uh, some of these deals that we've done, whether it's with the church or the public housing authorities or any other municipality where other developers preceded us, they had the science just like we did. Yeah. They just didn't have the art. That's why they weren't able to pull it through. And we did. Yeah. And so I focus every day on the creativity side, man. I'm always creating. I'm thinking. I, this is my passion. Mm. So working 12, 14, 16 hours a day, to me, is just like I'm continuing to, you know, work on, you know, my blueprint. You still work really, really hard? I yeah. work really hard, man. It's hard for somebody to keep up with me. You ever, like, would you ever see yourself chilling? Like, Sometimes just... part of me chilling is creating. Ah, uh, see, I'll be trying to explain that to people, man. Yes. Work is my relaxation. It's my it's relaxation. So there's two types of work. There's work where it's operational, where you're reviewing documents, you know, you're signing stuff, mm -hmm. dealing with HR, dealing with insurance, things that are just like, you know, I can get somebody else to really do that. Yeah. It's very important. Don't get me wrong. Yeah. But that's just the process that is repetitive. Yeah. But then there's the creativity side. What all goes in into putting a deal together? You know, just getting, just the, garnering the political support, the neighborhood support, sitting down and talking to these seniors, going that's to their smart. neighborhood meetings, you know, getting them over, you know, their, the, the, the hump as far as being scared and whatnot. You know, I, I, I get to live the front end and the back end of it. I know, you know, little old ladies who initially, you know, would put me through the woodshed when I first showed up and said I was going to do a deal at a, at a zoning meeting. Say, oh, you're a crook just like every other developer. And those are my girlfriends now, right, right, you know, right. in the neighborhood on my property. For sure. Because I did what I said I was going to do. Mm. Do, you do, okay. a, do you like doing like mentorship or anything like that? I do, the, I do a lot of that. Do a lot of mentorship with a lot of college students who really, even today, whether they're in a tier one university, PWI or HBCU, still don't know about all the career opportunities that exist in real estate development. They still think you're either in sales or brokerage or you're flipping homes, okay? And which is really so far removed from that part of the business. Don't get me wrong. That's a big part of the business, a major part of the industry. But there's a whole other world and career opportunities related to real estate development itself. And so I mentor a lot of students that are in pursuing master's in real estate programs, yeah. um, with University of Florida, Georgia Tech, other universities, some that are already in their careers who are frustrated uh, uh, architect or frustrated lawyer. It's like, yeah. you know what? I want to go. I'm, I, I don't want to do law and practice law anymore. Mm -hmm. I want, and they have that entrepreneurial fire. Yeah. inside of them. You can tell they have it. And like, yeah, this was cool. That's what everybody steered me towards. And I want to be more entrepreneurial. How do I get into real estate development? So I um, mentor them. I even mentor those who've been in the business for a long time. Gotcha. Okay. As far as, you know, kind of the do's and don'ts, which is one of the reasons why we created, you know, this pilot show called Shape the Deal. Right. right where right. Shape the Deal is a pilot show that'll come out um, in January where I was like, you know what, how can I actually get this information out and share with people what the process of real estate development is? Mm -hmm. It's not just flipping homes, you know? It's not just selling homes. It's, there's the due diligence process, which is very involving. Yeah. There's the acquisition process, whether it's raw land or whether it's buying a building. You know, like in your case, you could be in either side of the acquisition process, mm -hmm. depending on what the opportunity yeah, that, sure. you know, that's brought before you. Um, and what the financing opportunities are. Then you have the debt financing side. So once you have the deal, then how are you going to finance? Yeah. Then you have the capital investment. You may decide, hey, you know what? You want your studio, mm -hmm. but you may have to put a million dollars in capital. And it's like, look, 
maybe you only put 500,000 and you bring in some investors mm -hmm. that'll be your capital partners that believe in what you do, believe in the real estate deal, and they're putting in 500. So guess what? You can now invest that 500 and do something else. That's real. Okay, and now you're diversifying just your, your you know, your liquidity and just other income producing assets cuz you're going to have an income producing asset with your studio. So when we created that show, we're like, look, these are going to be just these little 30 minute reels where we give people a little flavor about mm -hmm. the real estate development process. Mm -hmm. And so we'll focus on those four components. And what I was able to do was just really tap into my network, mm -hmm. whether it's the, uh, the uh, uh, Raymond James of the world that I've done uh, you know, business with or whether it's Bank of America, mm -hmm. whether it's the Dwight Capitals of the world, I mean, it didn't matter they were able to participate or the Bercadias in the different shows that I was actually, you know, oh. putting together for each one of those segments. And so we're looking forward to release that, man, in, um, in January. I hope that is well received yeah. because it finally helps demystify a lot of the secrets of the trade, you know, of this business itself yeah. and the complexities that are involved with it, but also the opportunities yeah. that are out there in the commercial real estate development business. That's what I need to know, man. I need to see them opportunities, brother. Just think Goodness about it. Gracious. Everybody that is pretty wealthy, that's created well, not mm -hmm. nouveau riche or whatnot, just pretty wealthy individuals. Mm -hmm. You look at their financial statements, there's a lion's share of their wealth, their net worth, that is backed by income-producing assets. Mm -hmm. It's real estate. You gonna help me? It. You gonna help me out? I help you, man. Hey, man. I got you. Yeah, here, I man. got you, man. <laughs> you the goat. <laughs> Look, man, I got. I got to do a quick uh, commercial. Then I'm. Uh, I'm gonna pass it back to you so everybody can know how to find you. And then you gotta close this out with with a word of wisdom. All right. All right. So yeah. uh, this episode is sponsored by The Morning Meetup. The Morning Meetup is the only organization that gathers every single day. Let me just tell you about The Morning Meetup, and I think you'll enjoy it. So I put together this organization. It's called The Morning Meetup, where we have entrepreneurs from all across the country that join us at 8 a.m. Eastern Standard Time every single day, Monday through Friday. Like on Zoom calls, like you'll see the little boxes and you'll see five, 600 people yeah. every single day. So we'll have like a theme for the month and the theme of the month will be supported by today's call. Like we have Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. I do um, Q&A on Thursday where they just ask me questions about the business and right. I bring on industry experts or um, you know people that have been successful to kind of impart some wisdom so I definitely need you on on okay. that you'll, you'll be thoroughly impressed you'll see like four or five hundred people and wow. you'll be able to pour into hungry entrepreneurs and I think people need to be a part of it just um, just because community is super important so they can just come on the morning meetup and I do it for a dollar trial just to see if they like it for seven days. If they do like it, they can stay at $79 a month. If they don't like it, they can just leave, but only a dollar trial. So go to the morning meetup.com. You're going to see Eddie on there dropping bars. <laughs> all right. So Eddie, man, thank you so much. I want to say uh, thank you on behalf of uh, all the entrepreneurs and really just to get like some of your wisdom. You are just a really, really wise man. And I can tell that like you're, you're a strategist and the way you think is just, past the surface. That's what a lot that I got from today, man. So I want to say thank you. Um, and oh, I got to ask this one question. Where do you see yourself in the next five years? Because I want to be able to watch this interview and I want to say, well, five years ago, I interviewed Eddie and look, he is doing exactly what he said he was going to do five years previous. Whether it's going to be a billion dollars under assets or yeah. I don't know. Well, what do you see yourself in five years? Well, first of all, Thank you for having me on the show, David. Absolutely. This is great. You know, you're doing a great thing. Um, a lot of great followers. For us, five years from now, we, it's interesting you asked that question because we, part of our strategic plan was to, in 2020, was to look at a five-year outlook for 2025. So pandemic hit and we had to shift it a little bit. But five years from now, we definitely are on the path of growing our portfolio that we'll have under ownership over a billion dollars mm. that we'll own. So um, we nice. believe that we can scale up to that. We'll most likely be in about 10 states that we'll continue to be active in, but really more in the East Coast, a little bit, you know, West. And then we'll have more international presence. We just opened an office in the U.S. Virgin Islands. Really? So we're pursuing our first development in St. Thomas. And so that's very exciting, you know, for us. So that will be our eighth state 
for 2022. Senior development? No, this will be more um, more affordable type of development, workforce development. It's right next to the University of uh, Virgin Islands, right downtown. So it will attract not only students, but people who are employed downtown. They're just in a huge, have a huge need for housing. You know, the last couple of hurricanes really destroyed a lot of their housing stock. So um, that is a huge demand um, down there for uh, for housing. So you we're sell working. condos or just strictly no? These rentals? are going to be apartments. Right? Gotcha. So we're working in partnership with the Port Authority on land that they own because this is literally not too far from the airport downtown, and so this is land that they own that was given to them by the FAA. So this will be a long term ground lease on this land, and we gotcha. will develop about a hundred. 20 to 130 units there. In the Virgin Islands. In the Virgin Islands, St. Thomas. Yes. So um, we will continue to be vertically integrated um, with the um, other three, you know, companies that we have, which again is property management, construction management, advisory. I think the third, I mean, the fourth um, entity that we're looking to grow is the energy side Mm -hmm. of our business, um, which is Benoit Group Energy, where we're able to partner as a minority partner with different utility companies on some of their large, you know, projects that require more program management, construction management, oversight, but also that can, you know, create an opportunity to build more housing, you know, in those areas that they're looking to clean up. Mm. Okay. So that is really the spin on that. So we've been having conversations with companies like the Southern companies of the world um, to see how we can fit and align within their business plans in the years to come and how we can be be a value based on what we do as an organization. That is dope, man. Golly. Well, Eddie, again, man, thank you so much. And I can't wait to watch this five years from now. And uh, you got your own Southern company. You know what I mean? Oh, man. (laughs) But uh, yeah, let everybody know how to find you and then just close us out with a word of wisdom, man. You just got to put a bow on this whole conversation. Yeah, definitely. You know, the Benoit Group, we're headquartered here in Atlanta. And um, it's www.thebenoitgroup.com. And uh, we're in Sandy Springs, 6780 Roswell Road. And that is Sandy Springs, 30328. Um, from a wisdom standpoint, I guess it's not just one word. Um, first thing I tell everybody is if you're interested in playing in the real estate development world, and you're looking to invest seriously. Make sure that you're ready to listen, number one. That is key. Uh, because it's real money. Yeah. You know, um, in Vegas, you gamble and you have a chance to win. And even if you lose, you still had the fun of Vegas, mm-hmm. right? Yeah, for sure. When you lose on an RFP, you have nothing gratifying. <laughs> okay, whatsoever. Right, right, for sure. Okay, whatsoever. That is a bad... Every time you drive by the property, you look the opposite direction. Right, right, right. By the way. <laughs> so you need to listen, but also um, align yourself with seasoned developers that's been there, done that, that have the experience the financial worth all, and understand the product type that you're looking to work on. Mm-hmm. And, you know, because the, the one thing you don't want to do is to venture out there on your own and think that, oh, you know, I can figure this out. I can read on the internet. I can buy books and whatnot. Mm-hmm. Oh, my God, you know, you know enough to be dangerous and it will, you'll self-destruct. Mm-hmm. And the other thing is, is never fall in love with any one deal. It doesn't matter what kind of deal it is. Never fall in love with it. I don't care. Because every deal always looks like, oh, man, it's going to be the best deal yeah. ever. But you can't fall in love with it because once you start doing your due diligence and you realize you've hit a point of resistance, this is not going to work. Mm-hmm. Okay? Even though you had all of these signals and all these factors that led you to believe that the demand was there and that there was a fit, at this point, it doesn't fit you should be ready to abort, give up, move on, cut your losses and go focus on, you know, the next deal. It's kind of like the golf shot. You know, you're out there on the golf course, you hit a bad shot, can't worry about that shot anymore because the ball is where it is. You need to focus on the next shot and making sure you can get on the green. Mm. Okay. 
Listen, man, you can't close it out no better than that, man. Thank you so much. Uh, make sure y'all follow Eddie. I, he ain't big on social media. We're going to get him on social media, okay? We're going to go. You got one? Did you figure yeah, it out? Yeah, we have one. We have one uh, Instagram. I just launched it. on Instagram. Yeah, I'll, so. I'll t- do you know it? Um, I think it's under my name. <laughs> we'll tag it. Don't worry. Make sure you get his get his followers up. All right, first off, and do yourself a favor, man. Um, go get you some social proof. I right? go build something, build it really, really big, but then come back to your community and teach them how you did it. All right, we are out of here. Peace. I want to invite you to pick my brain. Mine too. Mine too. Yours too. Mine too. Yours too. Okay, you guys. Brain. We are so excited because we just dropped our newest podcast series called the Brain Picker Podcast. David. Oh, it's going down. You get to pick our brain. You have a business idea, a concept. You're stuck. You can't get off the ground. You need the advice of seasoned, experienced entrepreneurs. Not only entrepreneurs that are practitioners, but we got a lot of people that we've been coaching all over the last decade. All over the globe. They got receipts. Not just that, you never know where your next investor might be hanging out. And the word on the street is, we got all the connections. That's a big fact. We got all the connections. So if you want to sit down with us and pick our brains. In front of our audience. And we're letting you pick our brains. We won't even talk bad about you for doing it in front of our audience, bringing your business maximum exposure. Find the link somewhere around here, wherever you see it. It's there. And apply. Right now. To pick our brain. Let's go. Let's go. Let's get it. Let's get it. (laughs) 